bandwidth and hosting for Bagel Tech Photo is provided by UK2.net. Web hosting for everyone. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of Bagel Tech Photo. Uh, I'm Kyle Swagger, along with the two pros, as you know, on this show, Mr. Uh, Ewan Rankin. We'll start off with, how as your, uh, how's your week been there, Ewan? It's been really good. I've had a nice time this week. Uh, I've got loads done, and uh, I got paid to photograph a rugby match for the first time ever on Wednesday. Ah! So, so you, got, you, got to, you got paid for something you love doing and love watching. Well, yeah, I mean, I photograph all the rugby down at the local rugby club on, uh, on a Saturday, and... Um, uh, that's my kind of contribution to the club, if you like. But and uh, but I got paid to do it this week, so sweet. We like that. That's always nice. Yeah, yeah. And uh, with us as always, Mr. Alex G. Fox. And uh, what have you been up to this week, Alex? Oh, I've been taking pictures, and I've been being paid for it. What have you been, 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 been taking pictures of? We've all been uh, learning anything. Paintings, and um, I've been asked to take some pictures of some very very pretty girls. Oh, that was on some very very pretty cars, and uh, I've said yes. And what does the and what does the wife think about the pretty girls and the pretty cars? Well, she'll find out when she listens to this, won't she? <laughs> I'm flattered she listens. Yeah, Only on suffrage. Yeah. <laughs> well, you guys have both have had a productive uh, payoff week, which is good. As uh, Kyle, as what have you been doing the, this week? Uh, oh, we don't care what he's been doing. <laughs> Not oh, what show. me? I haven't been doing anything. No, I've been working actually a lot this week. You know, doing the, uh, doing the voiceover stuff, taking a little photos. Actually, last weekend I took one of some flowers outside, and uh, stuck it up on the Flickr account. I don't know. I felt inspired. Good Unfortunately, man. I didn't feel inspired for the rest of the week. But I should go maybe and have the a look. weekend. I'll go and have a look oh, while we're do. doing it. Please do, please do. It's a white little flower with a little bit of. Uh, I think it just. Sprinkle just a little bit rained. I think that's what made me go outside. So it's taken with the iPhone 4 and it had plenty of light. It actually turned out decent, I would say. Good. I, th I thought. Guys, lots of uh, photo news going on this week. Um, all in all, I mean, it isn't like huge, uh, uh, huge stories. We've got uh, Cisco with the flip camera. It's uh, going away, it seems. Alex is going to take know a bit of kudos for that, I think, isn't he? Yeah, well, yeah, well I was actually going to draw it over to him. How, do, how, how does that make you feel there, Alex? Because you you do have a flip camera, right? Yeah, i got a flip camera. I've got a couple of them somewhere, actually. Mm. Um, they're the nice little things, but as we said a few months ago, they don't now do anything that you don't get thrown in in a bundle with any number of very nice phones, etc., etc. They didn't up the specs on it and um, I'm afraid they've paid the cost which is a pity because they were the forerunner and they were the trailblazer but they've gone and left themselves behind mm. they uh, oh. uh, I think the thing is they haven't evolved that's the key part and I think they haven't exactly. evolved because they got bought out by a big company like Cisco I think uh, you know buyouts all sound really good and then the people that have started the programs get lots and lots of money and they, they retire millionaires 550 million dollars was the purchase price but the problem is that you end up stifling innovation then as well sometimes because the big company wants it for what it can make there and now and then they're not interested in it and they just want to sell it on at the end or they want to collapse it. Uh, and rather than sell it on, they've collapsed it, which is quite surprising. I mean, I can't believe it was worth any more than it currently was. It's got to have been worth less. Um, but they would have sold it on for something perhaps. But what was interesting was that they'd got a brand new camera that was actually due out today which was going to do live web streaming. So you'd basically hook the thing up, tie it to your Wi-Fi, and it would automatically transmit direct to YouTube or something like that, which would be fantastic. That would be the leap yeah. ahead. That would be the next innovation. And also they had the quality rating. You know, there was always somewhere they could go with the quality. Start looking at bigger sensors, start looking at bigger capture um, sizes. But they didn't. They, 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 you, they just you... stuck with what they wanted to make the money out of. You know, I'm in the here and now. Uh, people are showing stuff on YouTube. Let's satisfy that market. When that market disappears, we're just going to disappear entirely, and that's not good. No, it's not. I mean, but do you think it's it is the cell phones? I mean, you mentioned this was going to have a mm. thing of getting on, uh, you know, getting on the web. But we have cell phones now that do that through apps and stuff. I mean, is it? We talked about it a few weeks ago. We we all kind of had this feeling that fl these little flip cameras were on their way out simply because everybody has a cell phone in their pocket now. At 720p, yes. But no one's got 1080p in their pocket, and that's where Flip could have gone ahead. 
they could have gone up to the 1080p market, you know, and, and killed that and made sure that that was their, their, their next step where they were further ahead. I think they did do a 1080p version. Mm, they did. Yeah. They did. But, um, yeah. but then, you know, maybe going further on from that, uh, you know, could you have seen a 4K flip? Probably not. Mm. But that's maybe not a price point. Cell phones. Well, the cell phones were only going to be up to 720p, and I can't see cell phones ever changing much in the next year from being 720. They're going to be 720 for a while now. Well, uh, you know, it gets uh, it gets down to how many times you actually use it. And since Alex actually has this camera, uh, the flip camera, how many times did you actually use this thing, Alex? Now, because you're also an iPhone 4 owner as well. Yeah, I mean, the truth is my objection with the flip is every time I went to use it, I had to go and find some new batteries. Yeah. <laughs> Mm. Um, so I've got a flip full of video that I need to go and get some batteries for it. Yeah, the iPhone 4, it, you know, it's charged because it, it's always charged. You know, that's just the way it works, and that's the trouble with the flip. I mean, I think this story and the what you really need to take out of this story is, you know, with electronics companies, it doesn't matter who they are. If you're a company that specializes in your one line, e.g. flip, they specialized in making video cameras and that's what they did. They have an interest and a sole interest in what they're doing. Once a big company, say Cisco, that you know, they've got fingers in every pie there is to have pies in, you know, it it no longer becomes important to them. It is just another piece of their company and it's as easy to get rid of it as it is to innovate. I think if Flip had stayed small, I think they would have had a far better yeah. shot at it. I think they exactly. we would have innovation, we'd have growth, we'd have potential with some investment rather than buy it. And something like a USB charger built in would have been nice. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Well, the flip is dead. And since it's dead, let's move on now to something that does look very, very cool. What I think we need on the, uh, for, for tablets to begin with, and that's Photoshop. I mean, you guys, photographers on the road, always out and about. Isn't it nice to have a, a portable tool, something in your hands, other than sitting at a keyboard and physically manipulate the thing on a tablet? No. We'll start with, oh, no, I, it surprises me, Ewan, because you do a lot of out and about. No, I think the, the tablet for me, for the, for the iPad, I have got problems with the iPad at the moment because it's not taking a charge, yeah. so it's absolutely, it's, it's, I might as well be using yeah. it as a dinner plate. The, 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 the big <laughs> problem I've got at the moment with, with, with Photoshop is that um, it would be great for preview, and it would be great to say, well, you know, here I can rub this out and I can rub this out, and I can do stuff that trying to sh shows a client where the end image may end up, but I'm never going to do serious editing on this thing because it's because uh, you know the resolution the view the contact um you know my fingers I've got big fat pork sausages so there's no way I'm going to get the detail that I want to get or you know I can't cut things out to high accuracy and those kind of stuff it's it, it, it's going to be a great little tool for for here's what it'll look like towards the end of, of when we're doing stuff you know next week I'm doing a, a shoot for a a local firm that does body shop repairs and that kind of stuff. So I'll be able to show the guy stuff very quickly, what he wants to see, but I won't be showing him finished images on it. Not a chance. What about you, Alex? I mean, do you see a market even for this, or is this just be is this just Adobe latching onto the 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 tablet hype, shall we say, right now? Well, that I struggle. I mean, I've got. You know, I don't think it's the most update MacBook Pro now because one came out a few weeks ago. But, you know, it's a fairly powerful piece of kit and it's a 17-inch non-glare screen and all the rest of it. And I did some work on it the other day in the back of the car because it had to be done there and then. And when I got back and put it on my big screen and looked at it, I'd made a real mess of it. And that's with their next most powerful piece of equipment that Apple produced. The only other thing I can say there where this may, may have a use and even may have a use for me is the working on it on the same screen as you're looking at it is would be a problem for me. But if you could use a wireless trackpad or, and a wireless um, mouse and possibly a wireless um, graphics tablet and you just use the uh, um, iPad as a screen, and obviously it would be running the software as well, then I can see it having a, a crop, a little bit of noise reduction, a little bit of sharpening, and then beam it off to the internet to your customer use. But I couldn't be able to use it literally finger touch and without all the peripherals to make you're it work get that. properly. I don't think you're ever going to get peripheral interface like that. Yeah, I mean, it, does, me. it does defeat I the figured... point of having an iPad. 
I, I just figured it would be, you know, I've heard you talk about your, is it the Magic Mouse? Isn't that what it's called, Ewan? Yeah. Yeah, I, or or no, not even that. No, the touch touchpad. That's what it was yeah, that you've yeah. had that you Track got. And I've heard, I've heard you say I've done Photoshop shop stuff with it, and I'm, it, it feels more natural because it's it's in the hands. I figured that would translate over to the iPad. That you would feel like uh, you're airbrushing. You would feel, but no, you're saying you, you you don't believe that. Well, give me give me an iPad with an HDMI link to a separate screen that's bigger, where I can see more accurately what I'm okay. doing. Then maybe, but I still don't think my fingers are going to give me the accuracy, because don't forget the the iPad is not the same as the touchpad, because the touchpad is looking for a single point on a cursor, and it it effectively rounds the circumference of your finger up to the single point where the cursor is. Whereas the iPad would say, right, if you touch me really hard, you're covering a bigger area of the screen, so I'll presume a bigger brush, and if you touch me me really light, I'll presume a smaller brush. Well, that pressure that touch pressure and that ability to to rub stuff out accurately around things th that would be impossible and also i think uh, does does this really support layers because i can't think it would mm. and layers is a huge part of what i do as is it probably I'll, is for alex yeah it's the only way i can correct my mess for, for yeah. most pros <laughs> yeah. i would imagine yeah there, there's a good question from dave in the chat room and can you calibrate the color on an ipad uh, the only thing I would say is if you're using something like Photoshop and you got a white balance card or something set from when you take the picture, I would tend, as I do on all PCs, I, did, I, intend, oh, I don't know what the word I'm trying to say, I would ignore what the color on the screen said. I would let the computer, e.g. the Adobe Photoshop, take a white balance reading and I would just take that as red, not red as in R-E-D, red yeah. as in the other version. And I would ig actually ignore what the color looks like to my eye. So color wouldn't necessarily be an, an issue. No. Hey, to me, it sounds like it's, it, it's with you, you, and at least what I'm getting from you, it's more about real estate. It's more about screen size than anything. No, I think it's more about the limitation of the device and, and your workflow. You know, if, if, if th th this thing's going to be great for showing off, it's going to be great for demonstrating, it's going to be great for giving initial image you know the stuff that i've got is in my camera it's on a two inch screen there's no way i'm going to turn my camera around and show it to a client and get them to think yeah that's a great image you know so i've got my little camera kit i can dump my sd card or um uh, and me uh me, me card reader into the base of my ipad and i can transfer some photos over and they can skim through the rushes if you like but in terms of finished article there's no way i'm going to go to a customer site and shoot something and give it to them on a data stick to keep or email it off the iPad to them. It, it, it's never going to happen. And I'd be disappointed the first day that a customer expected me to do that. No. Interesting. Enough, Interesting. Though, it's a consumer market that they're looking at with, with minimal egg. stuff and preset photo um, exercises and preset photo filters and that kind of thing. I think with, you know, that, just, I don't think they're even trying to touch the pro market. Here. It's probably why that interests me because it does, I could see myself doing a little bit of this. Maybe the you know if you're first getting into this, maybe and you want to do something on the spot or whatever, if it just feels more natural. But I don't know. I'm yes. surprised to hear you say that. But I also kind of, I guess, I can understand where you're coming from now. Sorry, I actually had a point. Yeah, I was going to say it's more of an Adobe Element sort of piece of software, or funnily enough, an Adobe Bridge sort of software. So mm. if you, I don't know, if you were at a wedding and you took X amount of hundreds of pictures people could look through them and then they could literally tap and put their name on it so you knew that auntie Maud wanted copies of 179 and 12 so yeah. that sort of thing would work and uh you know sometimes sometimes when i take pictures especially when it's a room shot and you know i only actually want the center part of the room but for lighting reasons i needed to light it wider and etc and i had every intentions of cropping it Sometimes when I have to show the customer that and they're like, well, why have you got this in it? Why is that chair in the corner? And I have to sit there and explain that the chair's only there because I had to light the room in a certain way. It's not going to be there when we're finished. It's going to be cropped. If I had that ability to just sort of quickly make a crop so I didn't have to go through that whole palaver every time, it may be some help. But you could do that in an Elements-type program as opposed to a full-fledged uh, yeah. Photoshop. All right, well... I, I, insightful guys I mean I'm really surprised to hear that but uh, we'll see how well it does for the average consumer out there because obviously that seems to be where it's pointed at uh, let's get into the pro realm a little bit now and we've been talking about it and talking about this D5100 from Nikon 
And now, finally, some reviews have come out of this thing this week. We've actually looked over at Tech Radar right now. Looks pretty good. Now, I'll give, I'm going to go to you first, Ewan, because you're the Canon man. We've heard a little things about getting the credit card out lately for some Nikon products. Yeah. How does this, how does this strike you? I was keen to go and have a play with this last Saturday, but I just ran out of time, unfortunately, before the match. Um, and I didn't get to go and have a play. And I'm promising myself next week I'm going to go and try and, and uh, go up to Calumet and see if they've got one in, see if I can have a fiddle with it. But uh, it, uh, I think that the, the thing with this camera is that there's no way I can buy it and start thinking about slowly transferring my lenses over because even that would be too horrific. The thing that grabbed me on the price on this, you know, £669 for it is excellent. I can then go out and spend another hundred quid and I can get myself a 50 mil prime lens. I think the Nikon one is 1.4. Um, uh, and with that, I've got the instant ability to be creative. And, and you know, if, if you look at most of what I do with, with my Canon, um, a lot of the private stuff I shoot, I shoot with my little 50 mil 1.8 lens. Um, and I just walk around with that on. I don't even bother putting zoom lenses on it. I just stick with the 50 mil prime. So I would see me using this personally and getting great results with it and then having the ability to shoot video with it having then that flexibility of depth of field from the uh, from the 1.4 lens that Nikon do and shooting 1080p video I'm not, with autofocus it's I'm, I'm salivating sorry hang on <laughs> <laughs> now you're obviously a Nikon man Alex we all know that so after seeing you know we got some test shots here we're, we're seeing the thing in action all the more you sticking by what you're saying about this camera yeah, I mean, it's not none of it's a surprise to me because I've sort of seen the steady growth of the quality in Nikon's sort of prosumer level, and it's I was just I'm not surprised. Um, they they're just Nikon have always had this thing of you know we're Nikon and we're just going to give you a little bit each time, you know, and it's you know we we could do it, the way the screen pops out for instance it's got an adjustable screen now well, that's fairly new on a nikon whereas it's been fairly common on most other cameras of this range for a long time and i think nikon's finally said okay right we're going to build a camera where we're just going to put everything we can on it you know for a, a good price and we're going to give you a really good picture and uh let's see what the other manufacturers do and i think this is their first you know, we're going to just give everyone everything and stop holding back every last little bit and pieces. So you have to update all the time. So yeah, I, I so so go on. Sorry, Alex, go ahead. No, I, I literally that's what it is. I mean, you could a professional could use this because it has got all the ability. It's got all the functionality a professional would need. An amateur can use this because it's got all the functionality an amateur would need, and it's got some added bits on it that I would never look at. I would never dream of looking at like some of the in-house correction stuff like that, or in-house rather in-camera corrections and stuff like that. But an amateur who hasn't got Photoshop and who hasn't got this and the other and has got no interest in Photoshop and everything else, you can get a picture out of this that will just be as good as you'd ever hoped it would be. Yeah, I think I think the one thing to think of here is that that you know as a Canon man, I've looked longingly at the way that. That Nikon's dealt with the high ISO and their image quality in the last couple of years because Canon really are behind them as far as that's concerned. Um, but I've never, I've always been realistic and never thought about buying one. This is the first one where I've actually thought about I, I could buy this, I could use it, and I'm trying to make up use cases and justification in my mind as to why I need to part with 800 quid. Because it's cool to do that and it's camera porn. Need no. I remind you what show you're on? Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, I've got, don't get me wrong, I've got the gadget book, same as a lot of other people, and I'd be quite happy to go and spend money on this. But, you know, looking at some of the ISO range shots that are on the Tech Radar review, they're really, really good. I know Alex was recommending it because it's the same sensor from the D7000. That's good enough for me. I really do, I really feel like getting this, but I wouldn't get this. I'd get body only, and then I'd go and get just a 50 mil prime lens on it, and then I've got a lot of flexibility in that, you know. And then the only reason you get zoom lenses is to stop yourself walking so far. Yeah, so it's it's just a laziness thing. Well, to me, it just sounds like when I'm hearing it from you guys, it sounds like if you're an amateur right now, and you're wanting to really upgrade, this sounds like a good camera to do it with. In other words, well, it's a, a you... silly part. It's an entry level upgrade. <laughs> Right, <laughs> because it's ahead but it of doesn't sound else. that way. It doesn't sound. I'm not getting that from you guys. I'm getting it. I'm getting from you, you, and that if you weren't invested in so many lenses from Canon right now, you'd switch in a heartbeat. 
uh, would I use this commercially? Probably. I was just about to say yes. Yeah. No, well, you've got <laughs> the lenses. That's not the same. But yeah, I would. I'd use it commercially. Yeah. No, I was just looking at the specs and thinking about the specs. And now I bought a D2. Two, it might have been a 2 eight. I can't remember now. I haven't got that one anymore. I gave it to my dad. And I bought one of those, and it wasn't that long ago. And that was, I don't know how many thousands that was. A good few, three or four thousand. Mm-hmm. And uh, this knocks it into a cocked hat, and that wasn't very long ago. Well, I think so, it just shows you where the technology is going with these things right now. We're, we're getting lower cameras now in a price range where even myself can afford that like I really want to go out and start taking pictures but at the same time it's it's already close if not I mean, we have a pro here both of you sitting here saying you would use this professionally to yeah. me that's good enough right there for what so you're getting you, out of this camera for the price of what you're getting Nikon went through a phase of making are they just knocking out I don't want to be too rude but they were knocking out rubbish they were knocking out a D40, then a D40X, and a D50, and a D50S or something. And, and it was just every few weeks, they put another label on the different camera, and it was just, oh, you know, it didn't blow the air out, and it didn't have auto drives and this, that, and the other. And to a certain extent, they said, oh, come on, let's stop knocking out the, every different model with a different bit missing. And we're just going to put mm-hmm. everything on one camera and say, there you go. For oh. your prosumers, buy one of these. And you'll be laughing. And thank goodness well, it, they've it, finally done it. It seems like they got it right this time. So um, it does look good. Um, let's uh, let, let's switch directions. <laughs> well, we're switching directions quite a bit now. The Fujifilm FinePix F550 is introduced now in your uh, neck of the woods there in the UK this week. I mean, what? We're looking at 16, uh, what is it? A 16 megapixel um, sensor on this. You got a, a 15 times optical zoom on the thing. Fujifilm, we've talked about on the show from time to time. This is obviously a compact consumer camera. You and again, as something, I mean, we got what? Fully, you got HD video, 30 frames per second on the thing. Price point's not too bad, 329. Um, what's your take? I think it was a certain point in the market for this. I'm not sure whether they've pitched it exactly right uh, because if you look at. Um, other like models around it, they're doing an awful lot more um, for uh, you know at least a similar sign of price, if not better. So it, it's the, the Fujifilm are coming up with some real nice ideas at the minute, which is good. Um, you know the, the X100 we had a rave about the other week, and it was a fantastic camera. It's just price that's letting it down. I'm not sure if this one's doing exactly the same thing. Really, I'd be interested to see what see Alex that, has to say. That worries me when you say that they're coming out with some nice ideas. But the products don't seem to be the form factors as, are good as and the nice specs as the idea. Yeah, the form factors are good and the specs are good. It's just, it's just you know, with the X100, I think they've just lost it on price. What yeah, about you, Mr. Fuji Man himself, Alex? Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, this is the juxtaposition with the X100. This is you're getting all your gadgets you could possibly ever want mm. for not a lot of money. Whereas the X100 is you're getting nothing, but you're getting sheer quality and nothing else. So for the market that they're not going to hit with the X100, they've got every chance of hitting with this one. But, but, but you know, the they're point, going though, f- at 279 though, Alex, it's, it's, it, it, would you buy a Lumix over this? At 279, um, you're getting the top end Lumix. I would, yeah, but I mean, yes, I would. I would buy a Lumix over it. Exactly. But, Fuji can't say I'm not going to make a camera because someone else makes one that's better. No, so they've what got I'm to do is you something. You bring this out at 169, and you're killing mm-hmm. the market at that range in that price range. But at the 279 range, you've got too many other cameras that have, that are tried and tested with with you know historical quality and recommendation from people like you and me about them. This hasn't. Yeah. This is brand new. This is untried, no, uh, and we haven't approached. I appreciate that, but then there comes a point of if you're going to make it for 179, then you might as well not make it because there comes a point where these cameras, there, there must be a cost to sell ratio, otherwise it's not worth bothering. You know, there really must be a point. But this is but going I mean, against what, all the things that we say. It's a compact camera that's tiny with a 16 megapixel sensor in it. Yeah, exactly. So, but what I'm saying is Fuji are doing the very thing that we don't want them to do. Yeah. We're, they're doing that very thing. But we also know for the majority of people that do go to 
um, an off-the-shelf store and just listen to what the guy behind the counter wants to sell them. I mean, Fuji can sell loads of these, right? Because if, if they've got an ROP of 279 and the, they're giving the shop an extra 10% profit, so the shop are only buying it in for 200 rather than 220 or whatever, they'll fly off the shelves because that's what the shops will want to sell. And that's the calcium dog turd version. Don't forget the black one's 329. Yeah, I was, yes. gonna, I was fixing to just say the same thing there. You got to oh. also think of this. If, you're, if we're talking about consumers here, if I'm going to walk into a shop, honestly, and I'm going to look at the Fuji film here, and I'm going to look at the Lumix, I'm, you also shop with your eyes. You base on looks. And right now, looks wise, the Fuji here doesn't strike me. It doesn't look like it has an elegant factor. It doesn't look like it has a rugged factor to it, in my opinion. And if you're saying that the price is the same as this, as the, as the Lumix, then to me, I'm more inclined to, to go to go the Lumix direction than this. Well, your answer is better than ours because this is you're the person they're trying to sell it to. No, I agree. That makes me feel important. <laughs> no, yours is perfect. Yours is the best evaluation of the three of us, mate, because that is the market they're trying to hit. They're looking at guys like you. They want a bit more manual functionality and a bit more range in the, in the scope of what it can shoot. You know, wants to think about aperture priority and shutter priority over just setting it with the, the, the full auto settings. And they're not going to grab you at that price because you've heard too no. many other people talk about other cameras which do more, which are guaranteed because they've got the market history behind them to deliver that quality to bring in a brand new camera at this level with that price is where they're falling down i i think I, i'm seeing alex's you know where, where he's going with on price point here i mean i think the only thing i can attribute it to right now is the tablet market out there everybody's trying to beat apple with their game at 499 no one's doing it well why is nobody buying a motorola zoom well it's it's 539 it's 40 dollars more and i already know what the ipad is but isn't there a certain is. time, Alex, and I will ask you this, isn't there a certain time where you've got to say, look, we've got to get something into the system. If we're not going to make a whole lot on it, then so be it. Maybe we'll make it in the future. Don't you think that maybe Fuji's got to be thinking that direction? Because there's so I, much I competition. Agree. Fine, I you mean, got me. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they seem to be, uh, I mean, their press release seems to be, for the first time in a long time, it's just numbers. It's... 16 megapixel resolution uh, results that you can be, uh, be printed out at A3 size without the need for any resizing by software. Now, what that's saying is um, numbers, 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 numbers. We don't really care about the quality. We're just going to tell you loads of big numbers and you'll buy it because you don't understand what the numbers really mean. Right. And this yeah. is the first time. In the, like I say, this is the absolutely opposed to the F100, which is saying forget about the numbers. We're going to give you a really quality piece of kit here. And if you're in, interested enough in photography and you know enough about photography, you'll know that this is a really good camera. We don't have to play silly buggers with you. And this is the absolute opposite. Yeah. Uh, th this is just going into the rat race of the marketplace. They could possibly, you know, you know, if they, like I say, if they give the shopkeepers enough of a percentage on it, they'll push this hard. And you know maybe this is their idea. They can they can sell an expensive one that they're not going to make an awful lot of profit on it because they're not going to sell very many. And they can do that by selling, making a lot of profit on a lower end model, and it might balance their books. But you know I know which well, one I'd go for. Well, we'll see where this plays out. I mean it's a big market, and we shall see uh, what happens. Um, shall we, guys? Let's get into our cheap thingies this week. Um, I actually <laughs> in the Etherpad. I only see Alex is here, but uh, you and have, have you got one? No. Did you I do your homework? One this week. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> he's being lazy. So I guess we're just going to have Alex's cheap thingy for this week. So Alex, what is your cheap okay. thingy? My cheap thingy. And if I was being really nice, I'd say I was discussing this with you and earlier, and he suggested, but I'm not because you and didn't. He's already admitted he never thought of anything. Right, what it, what it basically is, is not last week, but the week before, my cheap thing it was a couple of workman's lights. Um, you know, floodlights are very cheap, and you can you know, throw an awful lot of light at the subject. And this suggestion is, um, if you go and buy sort of cheap neck curtain material, which is very fine, um, I don't know, but you, it's like a very fine muslin, I don't know how you do it, like a lace, but it's not. Or one of those translucent shower curtains, you know, they're, they're normally whitish, see-through, translucent. You can make yourself a very, very large softbox. 
And the reason I would suggest using this is if you get some I don't know, bamboo canes and various things and just make like a tent out of it, you can take some very nice outdoor portraits using the sunlight and using these boxes that you've made to diffuse the light on your subject. You could make a homemade reflector at the bottom to, you know, throw the light in from underneath, etc., etc. But a lot of people, when they try and take portraiture, they either overlight, get massive shadows, and it's a real problem, or they underlight, and the whole thing's just a little bit soft and insipid. But using something like this, you can either use your workman light to to boost the the light from one direction and use it as a softbox, or you can use direct sunlight. And you should be able to, with a little bit of playing around and testing, get some very, very nice, softly shot portraits. Um, and obviously, it, it's for next to nothing the cost. And, um, you know, you can fix your shower or put your neck curtains up when you're finished. That's right. Uh, you could just take whatever's in your shower right now and clean it up and throw it on the ground. Of course. <laughs> well, I wouldn't put it on the ground, but I'd put it above the person. But the whole idea okay. is this is... This is going to diffuse the light, and a, a diffusing box of this size is, you know, thousands of pounds. So, right. um, you know, with a little bit of plan, you probably have to take a few exposures to get it right, and you will probably need to build a homemade reflector to bounce the light in from underneath as well. But you should be able to get some really nice portrait results. Looks, you and being the portrait looks, photographer could uh, possibly chip in. It looks. It looks. It looks good. It does. It's a good idea. It does. Maybe, um, maybe next week you'll come up with something like that too, Ewan. No, I've got <laughs> something. Oh, you've got something! You pulled it out of the hat. Please, please do tell. I thought uh, I really thought. My cheap thingy is the cheapest that you can get with the greatest amount of versatility. If you're going around doing nature photography or something like that, or shooting flowers, that kind of thing, um, and you want to carry something around with you that's not too bulky, then the best thing you can use is to take with you a roll of kitchen foil and a roll of uh, greaseproof paper. Get a really good quality greaseproof paper that's got a high white content to it, not the yellowy stuff that's cheap. Um, uh, and it'll cost you under a fiver for the two. Go out, use the greaseproof paper as a diffuser for a flash, um, or also you can create, uh, with some sticks, you just prop it up and you can create a little diffuser to diffuse the sunlight coming up to what you're looking at. Uh, and also then with the uh, with the foil, you've got reflectors, you've got a dull side and a shiny side to get different effects, and also you can scrunch it up and unscrunch it, and that'll give you a dappled light effect so you can mimic water and that kind of stuff off it. Sweet. There you go. Now, so you just pulled that out of nowhere, didn't you? I just thought of it, yeah. I've done it in the past, and I thought I'd done it. <laughs> well, good on you. See, Actually, you told me one time about light in the studio. Just stick some paper underneath me. Yeah, paper on the desk white, is good. White paper. White paper yeah. under the desk, yeah. Which I have right here, and it actually does work. It just so. reflects up. Good cheap picks, guys. I like those. It's something I can just you know go to the bathroom and grab and try out this weekend. Oh, I, I like that. So. They weren't that good. <laughs> no, come on. Come on. I mean, they're cheap. That's the way they're supposed to be. Something fast, easy, and cheap. So, um, Questions. Shall we get into those? We got three this week, guys. We only had two last week. Let's get into the question, shall we? Uh, this comes from Dave, and uh, it's saying, Hey, gents, uh, I'm thinking of buying a, a new lens for my Nikon D90 and perhaps paying over 1,500 pounds for a four, uh, 400 millimeter lens of, uh, for nature photography. This is a pretty big purchase for me, and I, I am excited about buying it. I'm nervous that this is not what I want. I know I can play with it in the shops, but I would prefer to have a go with it uh, for a few days. Uh, what do you guys really think about that? I mean, is do they well, do that? Do they do that in the uh, well, in the shops? Honest, Will they you let go you... And... Go ahead. Yeah, if, if you want to go and do something like this and you're really, really not sure, uh, go and rent a lens. Go to someone like Calumet. They will have... I mean, Nikon lens is a standard for Nikons. Um, I... D90 is a DX size, so you might have slightly more trouble getting one, but I'm sure they can find you a long range. Um, I don't know if they do a 400 mil DX, to be honest, but a DX being the three quarter size as opposed to FX being the full frame size, just to, just to let Carl know. Um, I'm just in awe that they actually rent a lens. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you go in and rent a DVD, you can go rent a lens. Yeah, you go and rent. The, I mean, I occasionally have to go and rent something because, you know, say a lens is going to cost me three, four thousand pounds for a certain lens. 
I might only want it once a year. Why do I want to own that lens? I don't. I mean, I have to, I have in time, you know, I've been shooting with Hasselblads and various things and I've come across something and I, I need to be able to, oh, there's certain bits you put on the front of lenses and there's certain uh, adjusters you use for lenses and I don't own them because I might only ever use them once in my entire life. So I just go and hire one for the day. Hiring costs you between twenty pounds and two hundred pounds, depending what you want to hire. But a four hundred mil lens, I reckon you probably get it, especially on a weekend. You could probably get a weekend rate of thirty, forty pounds for the whole weekend, and play around to your heart's content. I've just gone on uh, Warehouse Express. The only four hundred mil Nikon lens that I can find is the eighty to four hundred at four point five to five point six, and that's eleven hundred eighty eight pounds. I can't find anything else at that price at fifteen hundred though. Um, but that's a D lens, so is that? I, I'm not familiar. Is that going to be the one that's going to cause him a problem? Uh, no, I don't uh, I think the D lens, the D, DX is a smaller one. So they're all sort of D end. What well, D means is it fits on the digital. DX it's, is the digital only, though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, but the, everything yeah, fits like, on both on Nikon. Yeah, the camera it, all it, got same thing. Yeah, all it's saying is if this is a 400 mil lens and it's. Um, an FX lens, e.g. a full frame lens, and it's going to fit on a DX camera, it will just multiply it by a quarter. Is it a quarter or a third? I can't even remember. 1.6. Yeah, I think it's 1.6 Canon, so it's 1.5. So, yeah, you just add a third to it, so this will work out at something else, about 525, and I know that's wrong, but it's about that. So um, basically, basically, if you don't want to spend, rent a lens. Yeah, but also I'd say, to be honest, £1,500 for a lens on a D90, unless you're planning to upgrade the D90 in the future, that sounds an awful lot of money to spend on a lens for a D90. I would be more inclined to go and buy a 300mm lens at £400. Don't bother going for the 400mm. Go and buy yourself a 300mm FX lens that will work as a 400mm on the DX camera, and you can get that for £400 and not. Fifteen hundred pounds. You'll notice that you know you might compromise a tiny bit, but you could save two thirds of your costs. Do you agree with that, Ewan? Because you do a lot of you do a lot of. Uh, well, I've rented lenses. Stick-up. I mean, there's if you go to Jessup's or someone like that. I don't know if they rent lenses or you know Park or any of those places. They may, but Calumet definitely do. That's where I rented them before. I had a four hundred mil two point eight uh, lens off them uh, for an event. Uh, three years ago, and it cost me eighty quid for four days higher, which is nothing. I mean, that's a, that's a that's, oh, a, that's, yeah. a, that's a four thousand pound lens, five thousand pound lens. But also remember, a it. lot of these rental places will sell ex rental equipment, mm. so you might get a cheap that's deal anyway. That's also a good idea. Yeah, I was going to say that. It, it, just to sum this up, don't you have to sign some type of insurance or some or get? Is it like written a car? It yeah, comes with it. You, you get that's insurance part of, the cost. part of it, but then you have to pay a deposit. I paid. To, I, uh, gave him a, I gave him a check for a thousand pounds. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, but the, the lens I was renting was five grand. Well, yeah, yeah. We're Still talking. Though. We're talking five years ago more. But the thing is, if you've got an account with them, you don't have to pay deposits for most of these places. Yeah. But you know, the eighty pounds or whatever it is, the cost that includes the insurance. Mm. You don't have to take out separate Interesting. insurance. Interesting. Uh, I, that's cool. Rental lens. Uh, next question. Uh, Carl from Tampa, Florida. Hey, guys. I've been thinking about whether to upgrade my old Canon Rebel to a better camera. I've had a few lenses, and I don't want to move away from Canon, but was wondering if I should go for a full-frame camera or one of the D-series crop cameras. Is there a reason to choose one over the other? I'll start with you, Ewan, because you're the Canon man. Um, there's a lot of things that people say if you've got the larger because because with a full frame you're getting a bigger sensor so we've always said bigger sensor better quality because it's cramming less into the space um, if you go for the the the, the D series stuff then you're going to get a, a you're going to get a small sensor size um, there's also a suggestion that the higher ISOs suffer more on the smaller sensors than on the larger sensors which is an issue. Um, also if you buy the full frame camera then there's certain lenses that um uh, sorry if you buy the full frame camera as opposed to the the digit one then there's there's certain lenses that won't be used between the two as alex was saying there the the dx on the nikon i think it's the uh e 
series lenses on the Canon. I can't, I can't remember, but the, the certainly Sigma, the DC series, won't fit the uh, the full frame cameras. And don't forget, you get the the increase in zoom as well. So with Canon, you're shooting at 1.6 times. So if you buy yourself a 100 mil lens uh, at full uh, at full, if it's a zoom or if it's a static, if it's a static prime lens at 100 mil, at uh, that's going to give you 160 millimeters. Actually, not 100. Um, and a lot of people that go to the uh, the cropped end of the camera market don't like going back to f to the full frame because of the fact they see too much. The guy that I bought my uh, wide angle lens off my 12 to 24 Sigma, he was selling it because of the fact he didn't like the fact that he 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 was you know it was so fisheye that it was too unnatural for him. He just wasn't used to it. Whereas I actually that was what I wanted. Do you have anything to add, Alex? And don't and don't tell him to buy a Nikon. Uh, I don't really know much about. The, the you know the, the Canon to tell well, something you said was very interesting there that the there isn't a backward compa compatibility between the digital or the three quarter and the fourth frame lenses because on Nikon it, it it there is a compatibility but there there is an issue for instance when you put on a lens a, a DX lens on the uh, sorry a, a non digital lens on a digital camera you get the multiplication of one point five but what happens when you put it the other way around which is um, the mirror's too a, big or the the, the reflector is too big yeah but what it does on the Nikon it's very clever it automatically just crops the resolution and it only gives you a percentage that percentage of the sensor so if you've got a 10 megapixel camera you lose whatever it is the point a third of it so it works as a seven this megapixel is... sensor but it does work you just get less resolution it's just i didn't know that canons didn't work in that way the canons have got subtle differences on the bayonet fittings you can't oh, okay so you can't actually you can't fit actually them. get them on and the problem is that the reflectors actually if you even if you could the reflectors would impact the lens because the lens just goes that fraction bit further into the body Okay, but it, just to answer the question, in my opinion, for what it's worth, I would, if I could, I'd buy a full frame lens because of it's more future proof. Uh, there's, if you want to do in the future more, if we like, so I say professional work, and use better lenses, the very good lenses and the better lenses are all made for the full frame cameras. So no, but you, you can you can buy those better lenses for the digital end cropped cameras, but what you can't do is buy the digital lenses for the full frame cameras. So I can't buy the DC series. From no, I appreciate from what you're Super. saying, but no, what I'm actually saying is, if in the future you want to, like the previous guy was saying, he wanted to buy a 400 mil 2.8 lens, you're yeah. going to have an awful lot more choice on a camera that takes full frames than you are on a camera that takes a 1.6 reduced frame so you know future proof and if you want to use expensive lenses in the future then buy a full frame okay fair enough fair enough you agree with that Ewan? no i've just got something in my head it's the other way around for me but that could be just a, a, ca a canon thing if you look at it, it's the ex series the, the ex series i can't buy the canon ex series i can't buy because they're for digital only yeah, so but different my, lenses, different, different cameras. Because I've got a full frame camera. Yeah, just to make myself clear, what I'm saying is, the availability of lenses, the higher rate, the higher end lenses are going to be made for the full frame camera rather than the three quarter frame camera. But they'll work on both. Yes, they will. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Hopefully that answers your question there, Carl. If not, write us again next week. Um, our last question, is this from Pippa? Is that how you say that? Pippa. It's a girl. Yeah, thank you. It's the first girl God. to write in. Oh, <sighs> it's amazing. I was, I was hoping it would be a female because it's, uh, yeah, we don't get those very often. Well, she's married, though, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, still, though, at least there's a female out there that listens to the show. Um Simple question, boys, is how she starts off. I'm going to be at the London Marathon again this year with my Canon G10. Canon is popular today, Ewan. Trying to get a picture of my husband, Tim, as he passes. Uh, please give him a shout-out. Tim Smalley, is that how you say his name, I guess? Hello, um, Tim and, Smalley. Yeah, hello, Good Tim. Luck, Tim Smalley. And, <laughs> and we want to get better pictures than I did last year. 
yeah, maybe he's at Twitter. You can check it out. Any tips? Also, if um, if I want the uh, runners to be in still in the in the sh in the shot and not have any motion, what uh, manual settings will I need? Thanks. Love the show. Thank well, you. Well, the first, first part of your question, I'll get your husband to run past very slowly, and then that'll make the picture a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, make sure you get him at the end of the race. I'm sure he won't be running past too far. Yeah, because he'll look naked. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, manual settings. Um, well, on in a case like this, I would. I don't know much about the Canon G10 because I'm not a Canon man, but manual settings on any of these cameras, if you want to avoid motion, stick it on speed priority. Make sure you shoot them at a minimum of 125th of a second and nothing's going to move. You probably will lose some depth of field, but I think this weekend's going to be fairly nice in London, so you won't have too much of an issue with a, a light source. So I would prioritise with speed myself and not aperture as I normally would do and uh, let the camera do the work. Ewan, over to you. Well, if you've got good yes. daylight, and I mean, I think the, the I've got a G9, and the G9 goes down to 2.8 on the f-stop, so uh, if you've got good daylight, uh, even on, on ISO 100, you're going to have, you're going to be shooting at a th couple of thousand, maybe even. I mean, you might even top out there before the, yeah. the, 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 the lens may not even cope with it. Um. So I would say, I would say, yeah, you want two fiftieth to five hundredth uh, for, oh, for, for guarantee. But but no, I think two fiftieth is probably tops. One twenty fifth, two fiftieth, yeah, that'll yeah. do. But you know, again, stick the ISO to eight hundred. You know, you're not going to get any graining. There's plenty of light out there. I mean, I don't know how Canon goes. I mean, I know. I turn the ISO right down though to improve the to, to improve. Yeah, I appreciate what you're saying, but you know, if it's a, an issue of um, motion. I would just up the ISO a bit yeah, because yeah. Of the compromise will be so little with outdoor photography, I, you're not going to get a lot of noise. Without knowing what the weather's going to be like, absolutely, because I'm I, not going to lead the report. I, but say, I think it'd be funny if, if it rained, Alex. Good light, <laughs> take it down to about 200, and by nature, you'll probably be hitting well over 1 to 250th at that point. Well, I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure if it rains, but bearing in mind, even London in April, if it's raining, it's not night time. You should have some light, Kyle. <laughs> The, the other uh, we'll we'll save the rain for the royal wedding. Is that the <laughs> yeah, compact there is. Cameras, it's the other thing to think about seriously is that compact cameras don't do very well with things that are coming towards them in terms of the autofocus. And if you've got it at 2.8 and you're focusing on your husband as he comes towards you, then he'll be out of focus quite quickly at that, even you know when he's sort of 20 feet, 30 feet away. He'll run through that, that depth of field quite quickly. So... Um, there's a certain element that he's making you think that that maybe 4.5 on aperture priority, if you've got good light, would uh, would maybe be a safer setting in terms of of if he's coming towards you when you're taking the image. Do um, do the Canon G10s or the G9s? Do they have a continuous focus? Can't answer that. I haven't used it. Probably. He's, he has the I, G9. I can't answer that because I haven't got one. Okay. I'll go and get it out in a minute. There you go. I'll send you an email back, Pipper. I'll let you know. There you go. Uh, speaking of emails and your questions, you can get them uh, into us every week. We'll answer them right here on Bagel Tech Photo. It's bageltechphoto at gmail.com. And we usually do about two to three uh, per show. Uh, and uh, get them in. As you can see, we shall answer them, or at least attempt to. Anyways, uh, before we wrap up, uh, wrap up this week's show, that is, got to give a shout out to our bandwidth and hosting provider. That's UK2.net. Uh, they literally are the reason why we can bring this podcast to you every single week. I don't even want to know how many terabytes of data we've used already, and we're about to use up a whole bunch more because we've got Andy and Anako coming on the Mac show again this week. Um, but they, they, the servers have handled it. And uh, they've stuck right uh, with us. And uh, right now, if you go over to BagelTechNews.com, use that click-through over there. And uh, they're actually got a really good deal going on right now. What I believe it's what is it five pounds ninety nine right a month, Ewan? Mm, domains. Uh, oh, no, the domains are, are only a five five pounds ninety nine to hire for the year. I think something like that. I see. I see. Um, and and right now, but they got a. I, I think it's for their virtual uh, server, the VPS server, right now. And uh, they, they got that going on. And if you use uh, VPS Bagel, they're actually going to give you um, one month free when you sign up just by using VPS Bagel. So head on over to bageltechnews.com. Use the click through there. And then you can check out some uh, the VPS uh, virtual servers over there. Can I just and, add a uh, shout out to Don McAllister as well? Because Don's been very, very kind. Please. He's, he's given 50% off 
to any of the Bagel Tech Network listeners. So um, if you go over to uk2.net and when you look at the click through on the main page there right at the bottom, you'll see one for screencasts on Line HD next door. Um, get on that link, click through and use the offer code BAGELTECH when you sign up with Don. And if you're a photographer, you probably use an awful lot of stuff that Don's done reviews and screencasts for for image use so um, you'll, you'll have a good resource there and he's given our listeners 50% off so so please go and support Don as well he's, he's been very kind to the network and great great content that Don does produce I mean even before I was even on Bagel Tech his tutorials are, are by far the best by yeah. far the best for Mac so. and uh, we've just been reminded that there's 10% off VPS and a free iPad too as well on certain um Sign-ups for UK2 co-location as well, oh. yeah. Co-location uh, yeah. and remembering yeah. that they were uh, awarded given yes. recognition for being one of the top twenty-five web companies, uh, web companies in Britain, and uh, I would put them a lot higher than that. But top twenty-five is a good start. Top ten next year and top well, it's one not nominated, isn't it? So there's no decision yet as to whether they've they've won it or not. But they're in the top twenty-five nominations. So excellent. There you go. Well yes. deserved. If it, it goes well for us because that means they can uh, continue to support us. So, good deal. Because we without them, we would be lost. We'd be uh, on our third or fourth mortgage or something like that. I think. <laughs> it says we're not. <laughs> if if you want to get a hold of the Bagel Tech Photo podcast, it's simple to do. BagelTechPhoto.com. I believe that's pointing over there right now, and that'll take you to our show page. You can get subscribed there. You can also get subscribed in iTunes. We're there as well, as well as the other uh, shows on the Bagel uh, Tech Network. And uh, I encourage you to do it. You can stay up each week on the latest photography news that is affecting you. Uh, the photographer uh, hoping to be a pro or just, just getting into it. That's what this show uh, is all about. Now's the time of the show where we ask, where can we get a hold of the two gentlemen that uh, bring us this wonderful information every week? We'll start with you, Ewan. Ewan, where can people get a hold of you? Uh, you can get me at Ewan Rankin on Twitter, or you can get me at ewanrankin.co.uk for photographic work and stuff. And a lot of nice little pictures up there, samples of your work. So if anybody also wants to hire you, I guess they can do it through there too, right? Yeah, yeah. Send me an email. Sounds I'll do good. anything. Sounds good. And, and Alex, how about yourself? We, we yeah, know already, but go ahead and tell us. Yes, Alex G. Fox at Twittery thingy Majiggy. And I actually put up some pictures taken on the iPhone for of some lens flare this week. Yeah, I saw. Very good. Uh, they were all right. <laughs> Just to prove that I know how to press a button on an iPhone 4, that was all. Put a dark thing in front of a light thing. Well done, mate. There you go. <laughs> Well, uh, stay tuned. You know, we've got a lot of other things coming up in the uh, Bagel Tech Network this, uh, today. So, Max Show coming up next, followed by the big show uh, later tonight. So, I hope everybody enjoyed this week's episode of Bagel Tech Photo. We shall see you next week. Thank you so much for tuning in. Bandwidth and hosting for Bagel Tech Photo is provided by UK2.net. Web hosting for everyone.